The Republic might not have won the Clone Wars were it not for the involvement of the Jedi. At the start of the war, the Jedi were drafted into the Grand Army of the Republic as generals, and it was in large part due to their leadership that the Republic survived the first year of the war. On the ground, the Jedi were a force to be reckoned with, and even though their ground tactics were sometimes criticized, the Jedi as a whole were crucial for many early Republic ground victories. But they were much less universally appreciated in naval roles. While many Jedi soon got the feel for being generals, few of them had any skill in commanding naval battles, and because of this, their command roles in the Republic military often drew the ire of many career officers that were rolled into the Navy from the judicial forces. In fact, many Clone Wars era naval officers came to hate the Jedi, and in this video, we'll be exploring why. Attention, Sergeant on deck! By the start of the Clone Wars, the Republic had been without a centralized navy for a thousand years, but it nonetheless had an ancient and prestigious naval history. From 15,000 years before the Battle of Yavin to 1,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, the Republic Navy had been one of the greatest space forces in the galaxy. The modern Republic Navy, with its distinct aesthetics and obscure traditions, was part of a continuity stretching back 10,000 years to the Renunciation the end stage of the Piastia Crusades, in which an element of the Republic Navy played a crucial role in overthrowing the Piastia cult, which ruled the Republic at the time. Many traditions established during the Renunciation, including secret signs and symbols that Renunciates had used to identify themselves back when their existence was a secret, endured even into the time of the Clone Wars. The Republic Navy's heavy focus on tradition and historical prestige was embodied by the Generationals, a group of extraordinarily wealthy human families from the core worlds with an extremely long history of naval service. These families included the Daldana, the Holtz, the Ozuls, the Talons, the Wormyces, the Tagis, and the Prajis. And generation after generation, these families would provide the Navy's officer corps with new recruits who quickly rose to the top of their class. Whether they got to those spots at the top on their own, or with a few calls from daddy, is another story entirely. Even after the dismantling of the Republic Navy during the Rusan reformations, the institutions and traditions of the Navy survived through the judicial forces. The judicials took over the traditional strongholds of the Navy, most notably the secret training academy on the old Renunciate stronghold at Prefs Belts and the War College on Anaxis. Of course, the Judicials also inherited the Generationals, whose children continued to enjoy legacy appointments and other forms of good old-fashioned legalized nepotism. Of course, with the outbreak of the Clone Wars, the Judicial forces were rolled into the new, re-established Republic Navy, and Judicial officers were granted higher ranks in the Reborn Fleet. The Anaxis War College and Prefs Belt Academy both experienced grand revivals, and the old naval officer class, led by the Generationals, were excited by the possibility of leading the Republic to victory once more. But their dreams of glory were dashed by the fact that they would have to share command of the new Republic Navy with the Jedi Generals. At the start of the Clone Wars, the Jedi were pretty much indisputably in command of the Republic war effort. Theoretically, they were outranked by the Senate, but the Force knows they weren't doing anything useful, so in practice, it was the Jedi High Council running the show. As a result, Jedi officers always outranked everyone in the Republic military, regardless of their experience. In the Grand Army, this wasn't a problem since the clones had always been under the impression that they were going to be commanded by Jedi, but it caused a bit more friction in the Republic Navy which was dominated by recruited officers, especially in the higher echelons. As you might expect, these recruited officers, especially the generational ones, took exception to this. Their parents didn't pay for top marks from their academy instructors and promotions from their commanding officers just to have them take orders from a bunch of space wizards, after all. But to add insult to injury, the Jedi were not only outsiders to the Navy, but their strategies and way of running the Navy was wildly incongruent with naval tradition. 
The Jedi like to play things fast and loose, especially the likes of Aayla Sakura, Adi Galea, and Anakin Skywalker, who tended to improvise and throw out all traditional tactical norms in the heat of battle. To the great annoyance of the likes of Admiral Yularen, who constantly had to work around their nonsense. Some of this norm breaking was all well and good, and it probably helped the Republic win some battles. Anakin Skywalker's unorthodox and borderline insane tactics are a good example of this. But at other times, the Jedi's deviation from naval norms was counterproductive. For example, Jedi naval commanders heavily favoured the Venator class Star Destroyer due to its starfighter carrying capacity, as many Jedi preferred to lead naval forces from the cockpit instead of the bridge. However, this led to the Republic Navy overusing the Venator for most of the war, deploying it regularly in roles it was neither designed nor suited for. What's more, the Jedi tended to blur the lines between Jedi business and Republic military affairs. Naval resources were often used to intervene in Jedi missions unrelated to the war effort. This contributed even more to many naval officers' greatest criticism of their Jedi superiors. Most didn't really have the mindsets for grand strategy. Many Jedi were unwilling to consider or accept what naval officers saw as necessary sacrifices that were just the price of victory, and in the opinion of some of the edgier Republic officers, their moral code hindered military progress. As the Clone Wars went on, these sentiments grew, especially as the Jedi came under increasing media scrutiny and several of these critical Republic officers earned galactic prestige. Even though the Jedi overshadowed ordinary officers in most of the Clone Wars' major campaigns, there were a few theatres where ordinary officers took charge and were hailed as heroes of the Republic. The most notable of these theatres was the Outer Rim Trade Route, a major backbone of the Separatist war effort that had been steadily reclaimed by forces operating from Ariadu, once the Republic's only stronghold on the entire route. Republic forces at Ariadu were commanded by Brigadier Gideon Tarkin and Admiral Wilhof Tarkin, who did a masterful job managing naval assets and prioritizing different theaters to defend Ariadu from constant separatist attacks and steadily push back along the Rimmer. Their victories won them the favor of the Holonet News and it got Admiral Tarkin the ear of many powerful figures in the Senate. This included Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, who was a close friend of his, and who seemed to steadily grow increasingly open to Tarkin's advice. In the latter half of the Clone Wars, this advice became increasingly anti-Jedi, culminating in a memo Tarkin sent to the Supreme Chancellor in 20 BBY. This rather melodramatic memo called for the Jedi to be stripped of military command, and it read as follows. Dire circumstances require that I must be blunt. I fear the Jedi Order will lose this war if they are allowed to continue their role as the leadership of the Grand Army of the Republic. These recent weeks have piled debacle upon debacle upon us, and I cannot sit in silence and still call myself a patriot. I have expressed concerns of this type to you in the past, and you have been generous enough to offer me an attentive ear. I know your time is valuable, so this is not mere repetition of earlier misgivings. Republic intelligence has concluded its inquiry into the Karita incident, and I am appalled. The actions of the Jedi Council directly contributed to a dozen ships of the line complete with their experienced command crews being jeopardized by separatist sabotage. The Jedi failed to prevent the capture of one of their cruisers, the Renown, and upon interception of encrypted transmissions regarding this plot, dispatched their own mission, separate from and unsanctioned by Republic intelligence, to recover a decryption module. The Jedi Council placed in command of this most crucial operation an inexperienced military tactician and tasked a team of used droids to complete it. Their failure to complete the mission in a timely manner nearly resulted in the loss of all life at the Republic Valor Strategy Conference. Yes, disaster was averted, but is a hair's breadth a comfortable margin in which to risk the outcome of a war? Factor in the recent loss of the Negotiator, an entire flagship destroyed while rescuing truant Jedi children in a sector far away from the front lines. We are thus left with an inescapable conclusion. This is not how to run the war. 
As much as General Grievous is an abomination, at least the enemy sees the value in machine precision when organizing strategy. The Jedi offer no such discipline. They rely too much on wizardry and feelings. Such is unbecoming of soldiers. The Jedi have said it often, they did not wish for this role. I think the time has come to relieve them of it. I've prepared a number of alternatives that I would like to present to you in person when your schedule permits it. Until then, I am ever your loyal soldier. Tarkin got what he wished for. Starting in 20 BBY, the Jedi were steadily sidelined from naval command and in 19 BBY, they were, to put it lightly, removed entirely. With the establishment of the Galactic Empire and the transformation of the Republic Navy into the Imperial Navy, the Generationals and their fellow recruited officers took command once more and naval leadership never did anything dumb ever again. Just kidding, it was even more of a clown show after the Jedi were gone, but that's another story entirely. So that's why Clone Wars era naval officers hated the Jedi so much. But what do you think? Do you think Tarkin had a point? Or do you think he was just salty over the Jedi overshadowing him? Let us know your assessments in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.